This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, good afternoon, folks. This is Dr. Charles Parker, once again, a Core Brain Journal, and we have a quintessentially interesting individual here with us today, a gentleman who's done a tremendous amount of research, written over 60 peer-reviewed publications reporting on genetics, immunology, and developmental biology, and evolution, some of the topics we've been covering here at Core Brain Journal. And uh, this is Dr. John Morrow. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Morrow. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me. So Dr. Morrow has written a book called Cancer, Autism, and Their Epigenetic Roots. Now, we've already talked to Dr. Walsh talking about epigenetics a little bit when we had that one-hour interview with him on methylation. Uh, We gave um, uh, an hour to Dr. Walsh because it just was so uh, complicated to start thinking about this. And I I really regret, uh, John, that we haven't really had more time with you and really didn't prepare this because I think you're... Your material is so interesting and so deep, but what we'll try to do is package it up in a way that our our listeners can get something from it and really think a little more deeply about these important markers. So just a little more Mm -hmm. uh, of an interview, uh, pardon me, a a review of who you are. Uh, Dr. Morrow is a Ph.D. in Newport, Kentucky. He's a molecular biologist. He is president of Newport Biotechnology Consultants. He specializes in writing and consulting in the area of immunology with a focus on antibody technology. He obtained his Ph.D. from the University of Washington and did his postdoc studies in Italy. I'm not going to say this right. Universite uh, Studi di Pavia. I guess it's in this. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. It's it's good good now. (laughs) And at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. So he's been employed as several universities as a faculty member, including Texas Tech and Kansas University, and he's also worked in the private sector. For the past 10 years, he's been engaged in a number of consulting contracts, as well as authoring many articles, reviews, books, and commentaries in the area of biotechnology. And today we're going to talk about really very interesting topic, the connection between cancer and autism. So, with that quick inter- introduction, could you tell us a little bit about your personal life, who you are as a person? Sure. Uh, well, as, as you mentioned, I got my Ph.D. at the University of Washington, and uh, I was in the academic sector for a number of years. I did postdoctoral work uh, at, at two different very fine institutions, and uh, I've had faculty positions at, at University of Kansas and Texas Tech uh, University, and uh, I've been here in uh, the Cincinnati area. I live in town Newport, Kentucky, which is a small town across the river from downtown Cincinnati. Uh, I'm uh, married, and uh, uh, my wife and I have grown-up kids, and uh, right now we have a house full of cats, and uh, uh, we live in a historic uh, district in Newport, which is about a 200-year-old uh, river town in Kentucky. And uh, so I've uh, been working on... I got interested in, in the topic of epigenetics uh, in about 2013, I think. I uh, wrote a uh, marketing report on companies that were dealing with epigenetic uh, technologies. And uh, in the process of uh, researching the report and interviewing people, uh, I became somewhat concerned, uh, well, in fact, quite a bit concerned, because it seemed that uh, this was a a um, really kind of uh, a much more complex topic than uh, what I'd realized. Uh, there were uh, many, many uh, unknown aspects about it, and that still continues today. Uh, there's been a lot of progress made since I first became uh, interested in the topic of epigenetics. But uh, basically, uh, it seems as if the there's an epigenetic connection with a number of uh, different conditions, uh, including uh, different disease states, and uh, there may be factors in our environment that are predisposing us toward epigenetic damage. And I think that's uh, one of the big problems uh, today that um, we we need to address in our society, and uh, I think it's uh, a much harder concern than most people realize. Quite agree with you. It's a reason for us to be together <laughs> chatting about this, because... 
these apparently arcane subjects really do need translation right down to the public because look we think about the tremendous rise in autism and we think about cancer and so many people consider these subjects almost impenetrable what what do you do i mean it's just so mm -hmm. complex so we really value the time talking with you so let's talk a little bit right off the bat uh about First of all, uh, listeners, I have to tell you that uh, Dr. Morrow loves talking to the public. He's done an interview on NPR, which will be in the show notes. Uh, he, he's a teacher, and he's interested in getting this information out. But even at that, the term <laughs> epigenetics is still a difficult term. So let's, Dr. Morrow, just talk a little bit about that, if we could. What is that term? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, just about everybody uh, who's had even a high school course in biology, any exposure to biology, knows that uh, there's this chemical DNA. It's a complex chemical. It's a long tape, and this is what uh, our genes are composed of, and there's chemical modifications along the length of the DNA, changes uh, in the structure of the DNA, which code a message. And these messages make us what the, we are. And there's about... 20 to 30,000 genes in the human genome, there's a lot more DNA than enough to code for these 20 or 30,000 genes, and we don't know exactly what all this extra DNA is doing. A lot of it's been worked out, but we know that a lot of the extra DNA has the uh, purpose of regulating these genes that we call them structural genes. They're called structural genes because they make the structures of our body, the proteins of our body. Now, it's been known for a number of years that there's forces that control the expression of these proteins. There's things that turn these genes on and off. And one of the factors that turns genes on and off is uh, something called uh, epigenetic modifications. And what epi, epi means over, and this means over genetics. And in fact, what the epigenetic modifications consist of is there's these are uh, chemicals that lump on to uh, controller genes on the DNA, and they act as, as controlling modules that can turn genes on and off, because it wouldn't do us any good if all the genes that we had in our whole genetic makeup were going full blast all the time, and in fact, that wouldn't make any sense. So we have to have very complex regulatory systems, and there's a number of these regulatory systems, but the epigenetic systems are, are quite important. And that we know today that maybe half of all the genes, all these structural genes, uh, are next to controller genes that are, that are epigenetically uh, regulated or epigenetically modified. And so uh, the uh, epigenetic uh, changes or the, the epigenetic chemicals, and these, these entail uh, something called methylation and uh, uh, histone modifications, uh, microRNAs, there's a number of them, but these are factors that sit on top of the DNA. So the DNA message is not changed. The DNA message may, stays the same as it is. And this is, this is what people, uh, got, uh, very excited about, uh, years ago when this phenomenon was first, uh, observed. And this is, this is what, uh, uh, is driving interest in the topic today. That is, uh, you can have these factors that can be turned on and off by environmental changes and by uh, chemical modifications that control the epigenes, and you have a very, very complex regulatory system. It's like a, like a great network. And uh, without going into a lot of detail on, on what these changes are or what what these factors are, I think if, if we realize that there is a whole system of regulatory control uh, where we're, we have genes uh, or we have factors that control the expression of, of the genes in the DNA, what we're seeing is we're seeing factors that can turn on and off, that can come and go, whereas the messages in the DNA are fixed, and they don't change they change very, very little over time. They change maybe over millions of years of slow modification through mutations. But for the most part, our DNA messages re stay the same. So genetics really has to do with the DNA messages. Epigenetics right, has and then, to do with the reaction to the changes in the environment, 
and the evolution in our lifetime in terms of how right. we actually handle things and, and how we don't handle them, how we get stuck in, in counterproductive uh, measures. Exactly, yes. And, and so uh, what's, I think, one of, the, one of the great sources of concern these days is that um, it's recognized now that there may be there may be many, many chemicals and many modifications in our environment, changes in our vi- environment, not just chemicals, but stress and a variety of other factors that can influence these epigenes. And this means that we can turn on and turn off uh, genes that may predispose toward the development of the nervous system. This ties in with conditions like autism, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease, and uh, also, uh, genes that influence growth, normal and abnormal cellular growth, and this ties in with the concept of cancer. There's many, many other conditions that uh, I consider in, in the uh, book that I wrote on epigenetics, diabetes, a variety of other conditions, and I tried to uh, present some of the evidence. A lot of this is extremely controversial right now. There's uh, uh, many, many, there's a very active debate going on between scientists uh, as to the role of epigenetics and whether or not epigenetic changes can be carried on from generation to generation. There's some people that believe it can occur and uh, there's other people that believe that the evidence is pretty weak and uh, it's not uh, the question is certainly not resolved at this time. So, in fact, this was uh, one of the bottom lines in the conclusion of my book. I was arguing that we're never going to get to the bottom of this issue unless we can do a really concerted kind of moonshot sort of effort to uh, understand exactly what's going on in terms of genetic and epigenetic changes. And uh, I think that uh, what we're seeing now is uh, the, National Institute, the National Institutes of Health did get a big increase in uh, their funding this year. This is the main source of funds for scientific research in the United States. Uh, there are private foundations that fund research, but the majority of the money for research comes from National Institutes of Health, and they give the money out to universities and to private foundations, to research institutes, and so forth. So uh, I think we need to we need to recognize that this has to be a big priority if we're to really thoroughly understand epigenetics and to understand all the questions and the debate that revolves around it, which is a long way from resolution. Well, John, let me clarify this one point as we're going through here, and I was tracking on visually on what you were saying, and I was thinking about this, and help, help clarify this for me because I didn't quite get this point. It sounds like there are a couple of issues. One is the relationship, uh, sort of the genetics of epigenetics in a way, which is can, mm-hmm. can you see that there has been change through generations uh, that are modified by epigenetic change in one generation? And then the other thing, which sounded like it was parallel to it, but obviously related, is the concept of can we accurately measure epigenetic change in the first place? Yeah, yeah. These 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 are both uh, these are both very good questions, and uh, this I think gets to the heart of the matter, and maybe uh, gives us an understanding of why it is so difficult to study these these concepts. Now, there's a lot of work that's been done on uh, epigenes and epigenetic changes in uh, cells grown in tissue culture, in uh, lab animals, mice and uh, rats, zebrafish, just soft law. There's a lot of animal models that are studied. Uh, But, um, of course, we know that animal models have their limitations. Tissue culture cells have their limitations. They're not people. And uh, so the, the other side of the question is, can we study these epigenetic changes in human populations. That is, yep. can you look for chemicals in the environment that might bring about epigenetic changes, and can you correlate these with changes in epigenes? And the answer is, uh, to a large extent, you can, but uh, it, it becomes very difficult to uh, have a proof-positive uh, confirmation of 
epigenetic modifications that you demonstrated in laboratory animals and epigenetic similar changes in human populations. For instance, uh, there, we know of epigenetic changes that can bring on diabetic states, and there's several diabetic models in, in the mouse uh, which are widely studied and are widely understood. And there's a reason to believe that similar epigenetic changes may be responsible for this very large increase that we've seen in diabetes over the years. That is, obesity, uh, lifestyles, uh, drugs, other conditions could modify epigenes and bring on a diabetic state. But this is not, this is not proven. And, uh, it, we have to be very careful, uh, when we don't want to, uh, come out and make statements that are proof positive statements unless there's proof positive to support them. And uh, this is the reason that there's there's some really furious debate that's going on in the scientific community between people on different sides of the argument as to the role of uh, epigenetic changes. And there's some people that uh, argue that epigenetic uh, modifications are extremely important for a variety of diseases. There's other people that say, well, the evidence is pretty weak. And there's other mechanisms that can turn genes on and off that are equally important or perhaps even more important. Well, you know, the issue then becomes, uh, you know, in our audience is core brain audience. Uh, of course, we're all interested. Everybody's interested in cancer because it's a good uh, it's a good thing to know about because it's so prevalent. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our listeners have, have rushed with cancer. But one of the main issues for our group is really autism because we see... Right. Mm -hmm. Tremendous change going on with autism, and and I've had the privilege, as I mentioned earlier, I, I can't remember whether we were on or offline when I was talking about Dr. Bill Walsh, but uh, the issue is uh, his in his uh, uh, research institute and his training modules for physicians regarding evaluating autistic children, he's very, very strong on understanding methylation as it relates to autism. Right. And mm -hmm. he's really seen a a very clear, pervasive, um, 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 what am I trying to say, finding is the word, yeah. of, of under-methylation right. in the autistic population or in the autism spectrum disorder group. And that mm -hmm. methylation yeah. does have something to do with epigenetic change, yeah. Yeah, this is yeah, this is precisely true, and and it's been enough to convince me. Now, on the other hand, I'm not actually in the laboratory. I'm, you know, I've interviewed many people that are doing these these uh, research programs, and uh, I've uh, reviewed, you know, through journal articles, I've reviewed a lot of the work that's going on. I think that uh, the relationship between methylation and uh, autism, autism spectrum disorder is 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 really pretty compelling on the other hand of course we know that there there are a very small percentage of individuals who have a genetic a dna genetic based form of autism mm -hmm. but this is not the vast majority this is just uh i think it's like less than five percent that have uh autism genes genes that are mutated in the dna that are responsible for the autism condition so mm -hmm. uh that's that's certainly one component but uh, yeah, uh, the findings that you're discussing that have been made uh, with uh, methylation changes and the relationship to autism are certainly there, and I think it's a good reason for concern. Now, there is there is another point, and that's the point of whether or not the frequency of autism is is increasing. Now, there there's been a very dramatic increase in the reported incidence of autism in the last 30 years. And some of this may be attributable to the way in which the disease is classified. Mm -hmm. But the people that I interviewed for the book felt that even after you factor in differences in the way that the disease is diagnosed and differences in the reporting of the disease and so forth, there's still a, a, a repository of cases left over that show a very substantial increase in autism. And so w when you look at that, then, you know, you, you look for causes. Well, you know, we're exposed to huge numbers of chemicals in our environment and in our food, 
And in many cases, uh, these are very poorly studied or not studied at all. And there's thousands and thousands of chemicals that are out there in the environment. There's hundreds that are introduced almost on a daily basis, new chemicals that are discovered and are used for a whole lot of processes. Now, some of these are are things that are, are very good. That is, they're uh, drugs that have been discovered. There's uh, there's herbicides and pesticides, and there's uh, chemicals that uh, are used in uh, making plastics and artificial materials. And uh, many of these are there because there was a need for them, and they were invented uh, for a specific purpose, and they fulfill that purpose quite well. On the other hand, uh, there's there's a lot of question in many cases just as to whether or not some of these chemicals uh, may be may be causing damage that partially may be responsible for the increase in the incidence of autism. So what you're saying, John, just to get it down to sort of a magnifying glass, using the metaphoric magnifying glass here, we talk a little more carefully about it. When you use the word lifestyle, what you're really talking about is all the things that we're exposed to, from food to actual surface exposure, that really enter our bodies one way or another, through the skin, through the mouth. Um, mm-hmm. th- these different, even including, um, I don't know where you are with uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation, that sort of thing, but there are things that are coming into us that can modify mm-hmm. our, our genetic um, activities, which then makes it an epigenetic issue, which then can create mind symptoms that are refractory to just throwing psych meds. Psych meds don't fix these changes. They they can modify the symptoms a little mm-hmm. bit so a person is manageable, but they don't right. fix the underlying problem. Yeah, and and I think there's an analogy uh, there that um, back in the 1930s, the effects of of uh, radiation, X-rays, and other high energy radiation, the ability of these radiations to cause changes in the DNA was recognized. But it wasn't really until the 1950s that there was concern that exposure to radiation might be causing serious damage to our DNA, might be causing uh, increases in rates of cancer, rates of various other diseases. So it took years and years, 20, 30 years before any any action was taken to control and to regulate the exposure of the public to radiation. And I think by the same token, uh, we can see that if, if some of these chemicals in our environment are responsible for epigenetic changes, it may be years and years before any any action is taken to regulate them and uh, to uh, bring together a body of evidence that will allow us to understand what's what's going on with them. And uh, so, as I say, it takes a long, long time, you know, to turn the ship around in the middle of the ocean. So, John, I was looking at some of the reviews on your book on Amazon in preparation for this. I didn't uh, have a chance to take to read the book entirely, but I am going to read it because mm-hmm. I think this is a relevant, uh, definite relevant piece. And the name of the book, we talked about it early, Cancer, Autism, and Their Epigenetic Roots, is going to be available here as a drawing, and it's going to be corebrainjournal.com forward slash 039 drawing for those of you who are just listening to it who aren't uh, in this particular uh, you know, episode visually. Uh, mm-hmm. so thank you for that book. Uh, I, know, I know somebody's going to really enjoy getting it, and we're going to pick it up anyway because this whole epigenetic thing is what's going on in the field of autism. There's no question right. about it. Okay. So let's ask this question. So for our listeners who are still grasping and, and worried about, concerned about the uh, term epigenetics, how do, how do these other ideas like histone modifications, uh, microRNAs, what are those things? Those come up in the peripheral conversation. And I think part of our mission at Core Brain Journal is to introduce these concepts to the public so they're not so completely foreign when they come up. Right. Yeah. Well, I think one of the, the earliest mechanisms, observations of how epigenetics actually works was uh, DNA methylation. And in the case of DNA methylation, there's uh, what you see is, is you see modifications, uh, chemical groups called methyl groups that are added to uh, the DNA. And these are, are particularly uh, prevalent or they're targeted to these regulatory genes that sit next to the structural genes. And when 
when these methylation changes take place, uh, they can cause the genes to uh, to turn off, and so you can shut off uh, genes uh, within these uh, that are that are controlled by these these uh, uh, epigenetic units. Now, uh, methylation is one change that is you're you're modifying the DNA, but it's but these modifications can be reversed, and uh, so you can temporarily inactivate genes, and then you can turn them on again. And uh, uh, another another change that we see are, we, we see these changes in histones. Histones are proteins, they're complex proteins that sit on the DNA, and they cause the DNA to coil up, kind of bunch up, like kind of a mess of spaghetti, <laughs> if you think about it in that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, they can also... Uh, cause sections of DNA that contain the structural genes to turn on and turn off. And then, then microRNAs are, uh, another, another type of, of epigenetic, uh, modification. These are small RNA molecules that can complex, uh, with the DNA and then, uh, cause the DNA to uh, turn on, to, to be inactivated, turn on or turn off. And so there's a number of, of different changes. Now, uh, also, there, there are people who uh, study other forms of, of, of gene regulation, and there are regulatory genes that are not epigenetically modified. And so I, I think it gets to be a very complex argument. And when I did the book, I didn't, I didn't get into a lot of description of these regulatory networks because they're, they're complex and they're not well understood at present. And what I was trying to spell out in the initial chapters of the book was just kind of a, uh, a very broad view of epigenetic changes and what they are and then in subsequent chapters, I talked about uh, specific diseases, and uh, I talked about some of the history of genetics. I talked about uh, some of the the uh, more uh, s- striking personal stories that uh, have um, been developed over the years. And I tried to make the book uh, entertaining and uh, amusing. I added some uh, description of uh, some of the uh, Hollywood treatment of uh, epigenetic changes that uh, come from uh, various kinds of science fiction scenarios. Uh, most of these are pretty far out, but uh, they make a pretty funny story. And uh, uh, I tried to, uh, as I say, I tried to bring in uh, some uh, contemporary uh, social commentary in the course of, of the descriptions that I added. And then toward the end of the book, I talked about uh, ways in which uh, the public can uh, perhaps have a role in pushing for uh, a better, a stronger commitment to uh, research and a ongoing, uh, an ongoing recognition of the importance of uh, health-related research in general, but especially uh, epigenetic-based uh, research in particular. So what was that point? I mean, that you're driving to a very important point for our core brain uh, audience, what did you right, say yeah. would be something right. that we well, could do to make that, make the yeah. uh, awareness? Okay. Right. Well, I think there's a table in, in the book that I showed. Uh, over the years, there's been, uh, there's, there's always been a lot of support for medical science research and uh, also for um, scientific research in general, physics, chemistry, geology, meteorology. And this has been something that was, in the past, it was not a political issue. That is, the two political parties didn't argue about whether or not uh, it was important to do medical research or whether or not it should, it should receive a substantial amount of funding. But um, what happened was uh, after the election in 2008, uh, Obama uh, pushed the stimulus program, and the NIH got a huge bolus of money. Mm-hmm. And in a way, this kind of spoiled them for the next few years because this meant that they could fulfill a lot of obligations that had been uh, hanging fire that had not been acted upon because they simply weren't getting the funding from Congress. Now, that worked out oh, okay for a while, but then eventually the stimulus money ran out. And since that time, Congress has been so gridlocked that uh, the administration and the Congress have been fighting uh, over uh, funding bills in general. And uh, the 
the result of this was that uh, there have been um, major cutbacks in scientific, uh, in funding for scientific research through National Science Foundation and through the National Institutes of Health. Now, uh, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the raw numbers, it doesn't get, it doesn't look so bad. But if you look at adjusted for the rate of inflation, what you see is that every year science has suffered significant cutbacks. And this is this is hardly imaginable at a time when we are on the verge of of solving huge questions, questions related to some of these terrible diseases. And uh, a lot of this, it, it sounds funny to say this, a lot of this is not rocket science. It's good science. Mm-hmm. And it takes solid people to do it. But a lot of the work that needs to be done these days can simply be done if if good, solid people are given the money to do the work. And uh, this is what I think for a lot of people who follow uh, politics and science, this is something that's been very disturbing, that, that Congress and, and uh, the administration have been uh, using funding for science and uh, other aspects of, of uh, the national picture that I don't want to go into, that, that they've been using this as a political football and kicking it back and forth. Now, what happened this year was when the, the budget, the 2016-17 uh, budget, uh, was acted upon, there were major increases for scientific funding. But what this did was this hardly brought us back to uh, – to where we were a few years ago, and it was good that I'm, I'm not um, uh, I'm not being critical of of the advances that were made or the fact that Congress and administration were able to compromise. But we have to bear in mind that even though we did see a big increase in funding this year, you know, uh, of I think it was like a six percent increase in funding for the NIH. Uh, this only brings them back to where they were, and it's. Uh, I think it's like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland that sometimes you have to run very fast just to stand still. And uh, uh, I think I think we have to recognize that if we want if if we want our society to move forward, we have to address some of these the, all of these 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 big scientific questions. And uh, there's right now there's a lot of different approaches that can be used toward toward expanding our understanding of epigenetics and answering some of these, these hotly debated issues. And, of course, when, when people debate when something in science, it's because there isn't enough data to resolve it. That is, nobody debates the theory of thermodynamics or the theory of relativity because these things are just supported. They're just, they're just they're there. And, but... You know, epigenetics is one of these areas that's still kind of a gray area where there is a lot of debate by serious scientists, and and uh, sometimes the debate gets pretty pretty brutal. I've found I've um, followed some of these uh, some of these exchanges in some of the scientific journals. Sometimes these people get pretty angry with one another. Yeah. So we need we we need to get out there and 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 I think the public uh, I think the bottom line is the public has to has to realize that. There's certain there's certain aspects of our society that can't be done by the private sector. That they have to be done uh, through the public sector, and this is going to require that we make sacrifices and we spend money, and it may require that we raise taxes. And if we raise taxes, it's not going to be the end of the world. You know, for instance, if we could find a cure for Alzheimer's disease, and there's there's lots of possibilities out there right now. If we can find a cure for Alzheimer's disease, then we'd save billions and billions and billions of dollars. You know, the the yeah the the cost of of taking care of someone, both the human cost and the financial cost, is just mind boggling when you have people that are that are slowly declining from Alzheimer's disease. And this is something I think everybody fears that this is the way that they're going to end up is being a burden on their family, not being able to care for themselves. And there are there are a lot of really exciting uh, uh, routes to chase after. There's a lot of uh, different uh, 
uh, approaches to studying Alzheimer's disease, but uh, it's, it's going to take time and it's going to take money. And if you look at Alzheimer's disease, you look at the millions and millions of people that are affected. And uh, if you compare the amount of money that we spend on, on uh, HIV uh, research per person who's affected with HIV, with the amount of money we spend on Alzheimer's disease, with the you know, number of people that are affected by Alzheimer's disease, it's startling that we spend so much more money per capita on on AIDS research. And I'm not I'm not saying we shouldn't. I think this is a terrible disease, and we should be spending the money. But we've got to realize that there's a lot of other diseases out there that that are equally terrible. Well, John, Dr. John Morrow, thank you so much for a really interesting commentary. We're going to send people over to your website at www.newportbiotech.com. That'll be in the show notes. And is there anything in closing you'd like to leave our audience with? Hey, guys, let's really pay attention to this one thing as soon as we can as we go out the door. Uh, I would say... I would say maybe the most the the most important thing to follow right now is the relationship between cancer and epigenetics because this is probably the area of disease and epigenetics which has been most thoroughly studied and is best understood and there's most evidence uh linking epigenetic changes with uh, transformations uh, from normal cells into cancer cells. And there, there are, uh, I do have a lot of references in my book on the chapter on cancer and epigenetics, and there's a lot of information out there in the public sector. I try to follow this uh, as closely as I can, uh, but there's, there's new papers coming out every day, and it's a very exciting area, and it is accessible to the public. There's a number of of uh, uh, articles in in magazines, uh, magazines like Time Magazine, Atlantic, and so forth that that do have uh, articles that are written for for a lay audience, for a public audience, uh, which uh, discuss a lot of the things that's going on in this area. Well, thanks again once once again, sure. John. Really appreciate you coming by, and we're looking forward to another report down the road because this is very, very germane to what's going on in all of our lives every day. And thank you for taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm really happy to talk to you and spend some time with you. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.